Good evening and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival 2023. My name is Catherine Young and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session today. I'm a volunteer with the festival and I'm also a STEM ambassador and a civil engineering student at Glasgow University. I'm joined today by Eric Walker and Callum Potter. Eric is an enthusiastic astronomer and astrophotographer and acts as a chairman of the Highlands Astronomical Society. So, Eric, tell me a little bit about yourself, your background and what you get up to. Well, um, prior to retiring, uh, ooh, nearly eight years ago now, I had a fantastic career uh, in the whiskey distilling industry. Um, but it was a bit hectic work and I interfered with my hobbies. So <laughs> now that I'm retired, I've got masses of time to absolutely uh, just immerse myself in my hobbies. Um, uh, I'm chair of Highlands Astronomical Society, but I can talk a little bit about that, that later. Yeah. But uh, I've got two dogs, I've got a dog. Uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good life now. Very yeah. good. And uh, Callum is also with us, and he holds the esteemed position of the Deep Sky Section Director of the British Astronomical Association, which he was previously the president of. So you can tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I've been um, a keen amateur astronomer for for many, many years and I joined the British Astronomical Society maybe in 1996 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not, not a particularly long-term member of the association, um, but uh, I've always been interested mainly in deep sky observing rather than uh, planets and other things. So I've been getting into the sun uh, a bit more recently since uh, since we moved to Orkney. We moved to Orkney last year in September, mm -hmm. so we've had just about a year in Orkney uh, living on Rousey, which is one of the uh, outer islands um, and uh, it's it's been great yes I retired as well just about a year ago um, I'm obviously much older than Eric but um, he's uh, he's he, he, he retired a bit more uh, a few more years ago than I did um, <laughs> and uh, on retiring I uh, used to live down in, in Gloucestershire in England and uh, on retiring decided to move back to Scotland somewhere and uh, Okay. Picked the uh, the lovely island of Rosie to be our uh, uh, destination for a good number of years because I can't really go through the trauma of moving the house oh, again. Okay. I think. <laughs> Brilliant, um, Eric. I'll get you to kick us off then. And would you like to tell us a little bit about the club meetings you hold and any other commitments you have? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's Highlands Astronomical mm -hmm. Society, and uh, we're based in and around. Inverness, but we have members from a far afield, as far afield. Actually, we've got an Edinburgh member, but most of our members come from the Inverness, Rosshire area. But there are people from uh, Murrayshire and uh, uh, well, I've been everywhere. Over, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a very, very popular club. Um, we managed to keep the club going through the COVID uh, lockdown period by zooming our meetings. Um, but we got, we just, we were desperate to get back together again and, and go out and observe. We, we bill ourselves as the, the act of astronomy club. We love to observe. We love to teach people how to observe. Uh, we do uh, everything from astrophotography. We teach people how to sketch. We've got a really good artist in our club. Um, so yeah, we're active. We have, I think we had 105, 106 members um, at our last AGM, so we're actually yeah, we're a small but reasonable sized club. Uh, all ages, we were getting a bit older, I would say, at one point. But we have what we're doing seems to be popular, and our average age is starting to drop. Very um, good. And they're fitter, healthier, and they take part. They volunteer for things, <laughs> which, Very from good. my point of view, is really, really good. Yeah. Um, so what do we do? Yeah, we have monthly club meetings. Um, we have these at the cafe at Smith and Church on the first Tuesday of uh, every month. We have a club news. We set up targets and challenges for the month. Uh, we have a very, very popular one. We have an AstroPix carousel. We've, we show the images that people have, members have taken uh, mm -hmm. throughout the month. We have a parade for tea, coffee, biscuits, a chat, a very raffle. Important. To, yes, <laughs> very, very important. And uh, we raise money with a raffle. Um, and then we have the last three quarters of an hour or so, it's what we call club time. And that's when we have a spotlight session, somebody like last month there, somebody gave us a little talk and a demo on how to use a small telescope. Um, 
we've had someone at Aurora Hunter. Uh, she gave us a talk on how to find a, a Aurora and that, and I can talk about that tonight if, yeah, if, if, that's, if that works. Um, and we just we just chat. We're active. Um, it's just good. It's a good club. Wow. Yeah. Uh, before we go onwards, I should mention as well, if anyone at home has any questions, we are using Slido for the event. So if you just go to Google and type in Slido and to join, the code is 34355541. So that is 34355541. And I think that will be also posted down below. So you'll be able to find a link for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, going on. Yeah, so, so that was our meetings, but we also yeah. have an observatory. Brilliant. Uh, and that's at Culloden Battlefield, just at the bottom of the car park. And we have observing sessions for members and the public. Uh, we used to plan them in every mm. weekend. Of course, Scottish weather, you're cancelling about <laughs> 80, 90 percent of them. So what we decided to do was have opportunistic or ad hoc ones. Uh, and sometimes it's only a few hours notice that you get. Mm -hmm. But of course, by default, you end up with a 99% success rate because <laughs> they're guaranteed to happen. And they have actually proved popular and they can be any day of the week. Um, and we're lucky being in the north of Scotland because in the winter it gets dark very early. Uh, the sky's clear reasonably early most times and we have we get, we get great viewing opportunities. Oh, yeah. We teach and coach people how to observe. How do you reach out to these people? Then um, maybe a, a member. Okay, uh, if you're a member, well, if, if you are or not, even if you're not a member, on our website, so just Google for Highlands Astronomical Society and up will come our site. And when there's a, a, a viewing session or an event that's open to the public, you'll clearly see that on the front page of the site. We've got Facebook, we're a Facebook group. So again, you can find out what's happening in our club. Uh, that way, if you're a member, we have a, an active WhatsApp group and that, that works extremely well. Uh, many, if not most, of our members are on that, mm. and uh, it can be humorous as well. There's a, it's not <laughs> just there's a bit of banter goes on, which again yeah. is what a club's all about. Yeah. Um. So, I think we should just kick off tonight by talking about where do we need to look in our nightside? Where is the best location, and how do we go about doing that? So, Eric, could you maybe kick off the discussion on that? Okay. Um. Well, first of all, it's uh, who can do this, Yeah, I think. Um, and to be honest, it's absolutely anyone can do this. I know you do this as well, Callum. You've, you've done that in the past down, down south, and I think you, you do it quite a lot up here already. It's actually anyone. So I'm a complete novice, so I would have no idea where to start at the minute. Yeah. So what kind of kit would I need? Where should oh, I be yeah. going? Yeah, okay, right. So, yeah, you're a good, a good example of someone <laughs> that uh, we would love to help um, get into amateur observing astronomy. Um, it could be all ages, as I say, uh, we're lucky in the north of Scotland because it gets dark early. Mm. So for the younger uh, children and yeah. friends, or people who just don't like staying up late, <laughs> you get a good observing window mm. at a reasonable time, so seven, eight, nine at night, which is actually okay. Um, we're actually very conscious of the abilities of people um, because all abilities of people can do this as well. Uh, if you uh, if you maybe got limited mobility or something, um, we've actually rigged up an all sky camera, which again is another thing I can talk about if you want yes. me to, uh, so that you can actually look at the night sky from the comfort of your own home. Um, it actually works as well yes. if the weather in your area. Well, I'm from Glasgow, so it's very light polluted, a lot of smoke, not great weather. So that would be something I would be willing to have a look at. How do I yeah. get involved in that? Okay. Well, Tell okay, me I'll, about the camera as well. I will, I will do that. Yeah. Right, I, will, I, will, I will do that. So just remind me, right? Okay. Yeah, you just remind me. Um, yeah, and as I say, any, all locations, even though you are actually in a light polluted area, yeah. there, there is, you okay. can see, something. and I know Glasgow and I know Edinburgh, you don't actually have to go too far to find a reasonable bit of sky. Okay. Um, but if you live in Orkney, North Orleans, say, or mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, or you, you live in the rural areas that I live in, we are very fortunate with uh, pretty dark. Yeah. 
sky is have to say it's just the weather i think Callum, yeah it's the the, uh, the the dark skies are really brilliant tonight and if you get away from the the, the city like the city lights of kirkwood um, <laughs> and uh, get out into the darker spots um amongst the best skies that you'll get in the uk um probably better than most well, better than almost everywhere else i would say yeah. probably um and um but yeah the disadvantage is the weather so uh, mm -hmm. on the other hand you know the weather can come and go very quickly so um there are nights where it just looks awful and then it will just clear and it'll be brilliantly clear because you get this this weather coming off the atlantic and it just blows through and very little dust and grow up in the atmosphere that you get from normal sort of mm. city pollution and uh, uh or, or like dust from sahara is the sort of thing you get well, down, that's down, just now, isn't it? Yeah. down in england <laughs> that just tends to to clog up the atmosphere so we get a very clear often get a very clear sky up here, which is absolutely great for 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 looking at the night sky yeah. would you say that perseverance is definitely a quality that's needed then Oh yes, keep definitely. going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Persistence is uh, mm. <laughs> one of my my three P's. Actually, I have, I have, I have three P's about observing, which is uh, <laughs> practice, persistence, and I can't remember what's third. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll come back. It'll come back to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, patience, patience, patience. Oh yes, yeah. yes patience is the other one. <laughs> we patiently waited for that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you asked me um, what could you see. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, what I've done, because we're at the Orkney Science Festival, what I have done is I have prepared a couple of slides Brilliant. using uh, a freely available bit of software called Stellarium. Uh, and anybody can download mm -hmm. this and you can input your location and it will let you see, you know, it'll tell you, show you what you can potentially see um, from your, your back door. So what I've done is I have set this up as if I was on North Ronaldson. And the reason I've done that is because North Ronaldson got awarded dark sky status uh, last year, was it? Or the year um, before? Uh, a couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah. So they are looking to um, lever that, uh, that, that, that label and uh, uh, encourage people to come to the island to view the night sky from there. So I've set this up as if I was on North Ronaldson. Is there many other places that have that um, dark sky title? In the UK, the, there are a few. I can't. Right. I don't know the number. Well, there are, there are, I, I don't know the exact numbers. There's, there's various sorts of dark sky places, um, as they're called. And North Ronaldsey is a dark sky. What's called a dark sky community. Uh, there are also dark sky parks. So the uh, the, the the forest in Dumfries and Galloway mm -hmm. is a dark dark sky park. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also a, a dark sky um, park around in the Cairngorms. There is, there is. Um, yeah. And uh, then in England, there's Kilda Forest. Mm -hmm. um, and in Wales, there's the Brecon Beacons. Um, let's call something different now. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a few down in the south of England as well, yeah. um, which are dark sky reserves. Yeah. Um, so there's quite a lot within the UK already. Yeah. Um, and some of those places I know, they leave, they've, they, they, they've used it as a, they, they've set up astro tourist type. Yes. Um, uh, policies or ways right, to encourage yeah. people to go and stay there, you mm. know, camp or whatever in the in, in the winter and um well basically enjoy the enjoy the facility, enjoy nature. Good. This yeah. is all about nature. Yes. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. So what I've done, as I say, I've, I've, I'm looking at the night sky as if I was on North Rollins so what I've set it up is if this was 10 o'clock tonight. Okay. Now this slide, this picture, this diagram that's in front of you shows you what you would see now i have to say you don't see the little lines and the labels okay you don't see them in north Orleans. it didn't get its dark sky uh, island status because of that um you, you would just see the, the stars in the night sky what i've used this for this is a wonderful time of year to be able to observe the milky way there are people growing up now who have never seen and possibly never will see the Milky Way because of light pollution, like you mentioned, yeah. Catherine, you know. Um, but up here, you see it and it is it's stunning. And at the moment, it is directly overhead. So from the southwest horizon, pretty much all the way above you and then down to the northeast horizon, you can see this distinct hazy cloud and little 
shadows and lumps and bumps and you know it, mm -hmm. in this and that's 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 the milky way that's one of the spiral arms i think Callum, is it? that's right yes but the spiral arms of our galaxy um so the center of our galaxy is we can't see that from the uk because it's it's off to the southwest of this picture um so uh, as you get closer down that way then uh, then you you get towards the center of our galaxy so um we're looking across the plane of our galaxy which mm -hmm. is a, a spiral galaxy uh, a bit like you know sorts of other spiral galaxies that mm -hmm. I can observe with telescopes yeah. um, and, and there's one that we can one that can really easily see with the naked eye um, but um, you know this is our own galaxy uh, and um, the uh, we can see these dark dust lanes in the uh, in the uh, in the Milky Way um, so some of these black patches that you'll notice uh, in the picture and when you actually look at it for real mm -hmm. are are dust within our galaxy which is just obscuring the stars behind it so there's lots of stars behind there that you can't see um, and uh, and that's just silhouetting against mm -hmm. these stars so if you've got a clear sky tonight after this talk's over nip out your back door give your eyes 15 20 minutes to dart to the dark sky so take a little refreshment outside with it perhaps <laughs> and then look up and see if you can see the milky way and once you've seen it you've seen one of in my opinion one of the wonders of the night sky so that's worth seeing however there are other bits of the sky i'm going to point out some uh, bits that a beginner a total beginner Catherine, you Perfect. said you're a novice okay yes so one of the easiest things to, to see, and most people are aware of it, um, is look to the north and look for an asterism called the plough. I don't know whether that can be, well, I can point out in the next slide. I don't know what I'll do. So <laughs> find it, um, I say these three yellow dots and red dots are not, um, they're not there either. It's, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> right. So most people know the plough or the big dipper or the big ladle, it's called, or I think the, the, the the plough was the, the plough. Was called yes, the Grand Casserole in France, and there's lots of names for it, but it's a very distinct asterism, which is just a pattern of stars, easily recognizable stars in the sky. And if you follow its handle, and then you go down to the, the dipper bit, the bowl bit, or the plough, mm -hmm. at the very end, there are two stars called the pointer stars. And if you extend an imaginary line almost straight up above it, and that's the red arrowed line I've put in there. You come to the pole star, the north star. It's virtually due north. You know, when you follow that, you are doing well. And but what is special about the pole star? The pole star is just it's due north. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's due north. It actually, um, if if you take uh, if you take a um, a time lapse mm -hmm. of it, and actually, I'm now going to definitely show you the off sky because that this will go you straight. Okay. What you just asked me. It looks like all the stars rotate around it during the night okay. and you get lovely star trails, circular star trails with this one area hardly moving at all the whole night. But it's, it's due north uh, and it's easy to spot. So again, go outside, find that the plough, the dipper or whatever you want to call it. Look at the end stars, extend them up and find due north. We teach people, the, 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 the scouts and the guides, they have an astronomy badge that they, they go for, and this is one of the elements that they need to be able to demonstrate they can do to, to, to achieve that. So we, we help them do that. That's another thing some of us in the club do. I mean, it's important to recognise it's been used as a navigational point for all of time, hasn't it? Oh, yes, it has. Yeah, yeah, yeah it has. Well, there are actually several navigation stars. I'm probably going to an area I don't want, but if you look <laughs> to the, the right-hand side of that slide, there's a bright star called Capella, mm -hmm. and that's known as a navigation star. And, uh, you know, navigators, um, sea fairers would have used that to help them find the pole star and work out what direction they're going. Brilliant. Yeah. But, but it's, they're not fixed, so if yeah. you went back maybe yes. a million years, the pole star wouldn't be where it is today no. and there, there would be either a different star or no star at the north pole um when you go to the southern hemisphere uh, mm. there is no equivalent to the pole star so one of the hard things if you're an astronomer in the, in the southern hemisphere is working out where the south pole is 
um, because we we often use the pole star for aligning telescopes to the to, to the north mm -hmm. the, to the to the north pole. Um, but um, in, if you're doing that in, in the southern hemisphere in Australia or New Zealand, wherever, um, that's much harder because there is no star there, and you have to use different methods for actually lining up your telescopes. So it's all a little bit more tricky. So another benefit of living in the north Scotland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What about the southeastern sky? Oh, yeah, you mentioned I, that earlier. I did, I did, I did, I, before we started. So, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, let's have a look at the southeastern. I've chosen the southeastern sky because this autumn, this winter, I mean, I think the excitement is in the southeastern sky, and I'll try and explain why. So, again, I've picked Stellarium, I've picked North Ronald, say 10 o'clock at night, and these are the areas you, you, you want to look for now. These are constellation patterns uh, that are famous, or well, known constellations. You might not know them, but there's Pegasus, the horse. It's not upside down horse. There's Perseus, which is a kind of curved Y. And there's Taurus, the bull, with his horns in the bottom left as we're looking at it. Actually, if, if you go to the next slide that I made, you'll I've, I've done some more diagrams here. So if you look on the left-hand side, there's the upside down curved Y of Perse the constellation Perseus. And in the bottom left, there's the head of the bull with his horns going, that's the, 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 the oh, yeah. bit off the edge, that's his two horns, you see. <laughs> so there's actually a very bright star in there. Uh, what's it called again? Aldebaran. Aldebaran. Very, and it's distinctly red, actually, so you know you're looking in the right area. But if you use Perseus, if you use the curved bit of the Y and just extend an imaginary line, there is a group of stars you can clearly see with the naked eye. So you don't need equipment. You mentioned okay. equipment. Again, I'll maybe yeah. talk a bit about equipment. But you don't need equipment to see the Pleiades, but you may know them better as the Seven Sisters. Um, and also, if you have a Japanese car with a badge and it called Subaru, have a look at that. And oh. that is the Japanese name for that group of stars. Very interesting. So have a look and find that star cl cluster. It's good looking enough in the eye. If you want binoculars, actually, I would say. Yeah, binoculars are, are, are great. Um, if you use a telescope, often you find that telescopes have far magnification for looking at these things. So you don't really get a very good view with, with a telescope or something like the Pleiades. But uh, binoculars are really ideal for, uh, for the Pleiades. We've just had a question come in asking, what type of binoculars would you recommend for somebody? Um, well, due to astronomy or just in general trying yeah, to see the night sky? Well, Advice I would give, right? So you, it's very easy to get suckered in and spend a lot of money on equipment. Mm. And you find out such is not actually as easy to do as I thought it was. And you've just spent a few hundred quid with equipment that's going to be in the cupboard. Yes, of course. I personally go for the like of 10 by 50 binoculars. So that's 50 is the size of the, the end that's right. captured in the light and 10 uh, is the magnification. There are very popular size, uh, 8 by 40 is commonly available, not too expensive binoculars. They're easy to use, what you see is what you get, intuitive. You can also use binoculars if you go backpacking, stick them in the car, so you can use them for other things in yes, astronomy, so you're not wasting so. your money. I don't know what you're, yeah, you're, no, if, if you're a bird watcher, then you know, just the same sort of equipment as you use for bird watching. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. works just as well, really, for doing some, some basic astronomy. Actually, many 10 by 50 binoculars, like you might get from even just like yeah. this, the, the cheaper supermarkets, yeah. you know, is, uh, are, are, are just and they're not too heavy. Usually just as good. I mean, sometimes you get a bad pair, but yeah. you know, they're, they're usually pretty cheap and it's sort of really worthwhile just trying them out. So the Pleiades is great through them. Brilliant. There's another object I've put on there. Mm -hmm. And you see the square of Pegasus, so the big yellow square. Yes. If you bear off the top left star in Pegasus, go one left and another left, then you go one up and <laughs> another up. With your naked eye, you will see a smud, a big area, but a smudgy thing. Yes. That's the furthest away thing you can see with your naked eye. Incredible. It's the Andromeda galaxy, mm -hmm. two and a half million light years away, current estimation. <laughs> so the light set off two and a half million yes. years ago. It's, it's a sister galaxy. Um, again, you can use binoculars, though, to enhance your view. You just 
up you go and you'll start you'll see the uh, the outline of the core of it you know so again have a go i don't want to have too long in this because <laughs> but uh, okay. go and have a have a look and and, and see and, and, and try and find it uh, but adapt you need to dark adapt your eyes definitely for that one yeah. it's, it's, it's 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 faint you, you you're best to let your eyes get accustomed to the darkness from at least 10 minutes probably uh, right. and after that um uh, after 20 minutes half an hour you know you yeah. become really dark adapted but you know you just get a slight flash of white light and that will uh, ruin that dark adaptation then you have to wait oh, yeah. another another 10 minutes yeah. 20 minutes to to, to get yeah. back back your night vision yeah. Now the other one in the southeastern sky, this one is uh, it's this this two planets there. Um, if we go down, you will see fairly high. I don't know what's that, 10, 15 degrees above the horizon. There are two very bright planets, Jupiter and Saturn, and they are stunning. They are really really bright at the moment. Um, so you can see them with the naked eye, no problem. As winter goes on, they're going to get higher in the sky, so even easier and clearer to see. With binoculars, with Jupiter, you will see, you'll be able to see the four Galilean moons that orbit it. Wow. Orbit it. And you only have to watch it for a few hours, you know, just a few hour intervals, and you'll see that those moons are not in the same position as they were a few hours ago, because they're orbiting Jupiter. So they look as though they're moving you know, horizontally <laughs> across it and behind it and things, don't they? Amazing thing. There, there, there are times where you, you may only see three. That's because, true. Uh, so if, if you don't see four, then it may be because one is behind Jupiter or in front of Jupiter and you wouldn't notice that with binoculars. No. Um, with a telescope, you might notice it if it was in front. Uh, if it's behind, then you quite you, then you just wouldn't be able to see it. No. Um, but they move quite quickly. So if you leave it for like an hour or two, then you might start to see them appearing okay. again. There comes patience back into it as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if I was to go outside, how would I find the planets in the night sky? I know there's apps available where I could pivot oh. my phone and kind of navigate to that area and then try and identify it with my eye. Would that be the correct way of going about it? You know what? It's, I think most people do use that. Really? Um, for, for, for the planets. The planets, honestly, if you go out and look just now, you'll see them. They're <laughs> so bright that, that you just... They just stand out there. They're really yeah. bright. Jupiter's really, really bright oh, yeah. at the moment. It's yeah. it's it's quite hard to to miss. Really, Saturn. You you might think that's just a star, yeah. depending on if you're not very familiar with the no. constellations. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty much just in the south, yeah. north sort of south, southwest, yeah. um, and it's pretty bright. So you would probably pick it up, and it looks a little bit yellowish as well. It does look yellowish. It also looks through binoculars. It's and through binoculars, not, you'll see it's not. It's round. not round. It's got, yeah. It's kind of. Planned, but that's the rings around it. I see. Again, if you use a small telescope, you will actually start to see the rings, and that's always one of my wow <laughs> moments. You know, it's, yeah, it's still, it's still makes yeah. me excited when I see it. So yeah, that's the plan. So, so start with that as well. That's simple. And really? It's always satisfying to achieve something if you yes. like, if you've never find done the it easiest thing that you can Absolutely. do and then move on. With Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So shall we move on to um, a little bit about? how we do it ourselves. So we can use our eyes, we've covered that. Yeah. Maybe we can use binoculars. So yeah. how about telescopes, mounts and eyepieces? How does one get involved in that? And again, what kind of equipment are we looking for, especially as a novice? Right, this is where I mentioned just, it's very, so a small telescope. Yes. It's very easy to make an expensive mistake. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> it, it, it is. We're moving up the product size here. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Even more expensive. Um, there's another place, but don't go to a toy store and buy a cheap one either, because <laughs> you'll be so disappointed, it'll put you off the astronomy for life. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance somewhere. Now, the advice I give um, is find your local astronomy club, okay. right? And talk, go along. And most astronomy clubs have public evenings. Mm -hmm. uh, was it? Americans call them the site walk astronomy and stuff. And you'll get a chance to use their equipment or their members' equipment. And that's the best way to see what is the scope that's right for you. You also get a bit of tuition on how to, to, how to use it. Um, and and, and, and so, so you go through the learning club uh, curve a lot better. There are easier, there's easier ones to use than others. There's a simple all eyes, which moves it like left and up and down. But get one of those 
don't go for an equatorial mount, which um, follows the curve of the bit and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, don't do that in the beginning. You will. It's it's not easy to use. I can guarantee you. Once you've got it, it is easy, but not easy for a beginner. And these things put people people off. Try before you buy. I thought this. Yeah, what I used absolutely. To join the astronomy club. You can also use a camera or a smartphone. Brilliant. You can take a picture. There's apps now that do a long exposure, mm -hmm. but you need to be able to hold it steady, and it will take an image of the night sky, and you can you, you see what you've been looking at. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's different ways to do that. There's okay. So you recommend going to a dark place. As dark as you can find. It doesn't have to be pitch dark. Okay. Because some of these items that, I, that I've described, objects I've described, it doesn't have to be pitch black. Just dark enough. Yes. Yeah. And L looking at the planets still. like Saturn and Jupiter, you know, you, you don't really need to be a dark sky. Yeah, to, true. To see them. You know, we could do that from the middle of the country without too much yeah. of a problem, yeah. really. Um, it's when you start looking at some of the fainter things like the galaxies and, 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 and other and clusters of stars and stuff, you get a much better view if you're at a dark, a dark okay. site. Um, but for the bright planets and uh, the moon as well, you know, you yeah. can... Oh, yes, you, don't forget the moon. The moon. Oh, God, how did I forget <laughs> that? It's, that is stunning. Mm -hmm. um, again, binoculars are good, but actually a small telescope. Um, yeah, a small telescope. Yeah, it gives great. you a, a much better yeah, view and you the, see uh, of the craters. and The moon, the, uh, the, uh, the, the mountains, the mare. Um, the phase moves all the time. You know, you go yes. from new moon to, you know, all the different stages, crescents, wax, and all that stuff. And every hour of day, it changes. You see different things. You see different shadows. You see something different every time you look at the moon. It's, it's a beautiful object, yeah. I'm aware we've just had the blue moon as well, wasn't it, just recently? Is there any other...? A blue moon is um, something like two um, full moons in mm. the same calendar month. Okay. It's not often, but it's not rare either. With a blue supermoon. Blue supermoon. Which, so it's, 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 it gets close to us, and there's two of them in a month. That's rare. Okay. That's quite rare. Is there any other events that are coming up with the moon that we're aware of? In the future, um, is there an eclipse? I can't remember. I have to pass on that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Okay, we'll, we'll, come, back. we'll come back to you. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall yeah. we move on to the old sky? Or are you well, I was going to say yeah. there is one, there is another way, right? Mm -hmm. Because if your um, your skies aren't good, the weather's not good, our club operates an all sky camera, yes, and uh. I don't know whether we can put the link into the, the, the chat or whatever, but you, this is freely available for anyone to, to, to use. It's actually mounted on the roof of my house, mm -hmm. but um, it's a club camera. And we actually use it to teach people how to get around the sky. There it is, look, it's, that's it there. It's on top of the roof, ignore the moss. I have <laughs> to clean the moss off my roof. But I got fed up during the COVID lockdowns and I have to do stuff. And I went on the website, found a, uh, a Canadian fella that uh, built one and coded the code for the Raspberry Pi computer. There's a whole, I, I've talked to the BAA about this. So if you go on the BAA website, you'll be able to mm. find how to make this. Um, that's on the roof, it operates 24 7. So during the day, you see what the weather's like. Although you can always stick your head out the window, <laughs> can't you? But at night, it uh, captures a 40 second long image long exposure image, which allows you to see things. And I think there's, I've got a series of um, images here that will let you see what you can you, you, you can you can see with this. This is from Conan Bridge. This is Conan Bridge near Dingwall. Um, so close to the next Yes. Open. Now, what you can see, this is a single image. So uh, this was like nearly one o'clock in the morning in 2020, uh, about this time of year, actually, in 2021. Mm. And what you can see there, you see that smudge going across diagonally? Yes. Like that's the Milky Way. Brilliant. Now, because of the alignment of it, I've got north on the right as we're looking at it, okay. south on the left, east at the top, west at the bottom, and the centre is directly overhead, okay? So that's just to get your bearings right. That, I think, Callum, was Jupiter. I was pretty sure that was Jupiter. Then, sorry, the bright light on the very left-hand edge, which is yeah, right. south, that was Jupiter. That could be. 
Um, that actually will be higher up now, uh, tipped more towards the center of the, the image. But you can see all the stars, you can see the patterns. Uh, if we go to the next one, there's sort of other things that you can see with it. Um, that's Jupiter, yeah. Um, but if we go to the, there's another slide I've got where you can, if you select the, oh, if you select the least squiggly, oh, we've jumped a little bit, I think. Oh, we're okay. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yep. Perfect. These constellations are damn tricky, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the little squiggly um, menu item on the left hand side and select it, you get an overlay of the constellations. So it helps you uh, identify and pick out. It's like an right. app on the phone. Yeah. But you can do this in your own house uh, live. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very useful. I actually use it all the time because sometimes I don't know what I'm looking at mm. and it, it helps me. <laughs> and I've done this for quite a few years. So, so even you, know, you still need a bit of help. There are a lot of bright constellations which yes. are quite easy to find yeah. and, and you become familiar with them over the over, over time. But They're worth there learning. There are an awful lot of constellations yeah. which are fairly faint and oh. fairly obscure and oh, yeah. really quite difficult to make out patterns. Yeah. So being able to overlay like this is, yeah. is a really good way for finding some of it. Yeah. It's what your app does that you were talking about. Yeah. If you yes. use your smartphone, put it up to we'll the sky, the it's doing an overlay. Well, really I think this is a better example because you're getting to see the whole sky yeah. in one, whilst in the app, sometimes it's a bit trickier yeah. to get the. You see, you've still got to know roughly where you're looking at, yeah. don't you? Yeah. yeah. And one of the problems if you're doing it just standing out on the street is that it's quite hard to relate the size of things on the sky compared mm. to yeah. how they are um, on, like on your phone or on your app. They look much smaller usually on your phone, mm. but actually on the sky, they can be quite big. So something like the Square of Pegasus is actually quite a big constellation. In the sky, and and to, and the stars aren't they're fairly bright. They're quite, yeah. It's quite easy yeah. to spot, but yeah. a, a lot of people will think it's actually going to be quite small than it actually is. Yeah. But again, you observe, you'll learn. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the best way of learning is by doing. Yeah. yeah. So if we go to the next one, which you know, in the morning, you the camera's captured all its images and it stitches them together, and you can get a time lapse of what happens during the during the night so this is very speeded up but you can see the rotation and if there's a star on the right sort of center which doesn't appear to move and that's the pole star you see it oh yeah okay this is how you start your day isn't it you look I, at the yeah, footage i actually do you know yeah so, yeah, it's yeah, quite yeah. Nice. I'm having my breakfast cereal. It's yeah. Quite, yeah 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 but yeah that's just what you do <laughs> um if we go to another one there's another it's just to show a few examples you, it stitches together all the images and you get these wonderful star trails and you can see the color of stars, the thickness of the lines, yes. shows you the brightness, the relative brightnesses. Um, that bit in the middle that is revolving around, right? So that small curve in the middle, that's yep. that's that's the pole star. Okay. So it's as much as it moves through the whole thing. Not a lot. No, I'll keep on going because I'm definitely eating up my time here. Oh, yes. um, you can see meteors and fireballs. Uh, with it, if you're lucky, you just happen to be looking at it and you go, whoa, that's <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just go through them just quickly. Um, there's a northern light, so the number north is on the right-hand side. This was a particularly bright one. The moon was up, and that's what's causing the brightness on the left-hand side, mm -hmm. and the aurora was still so bright that you could see it. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So, and you can see the colours and the structure of the rays. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, just Let's just flip, keep flicking through. <laughs> this is uh, the Oscar camera discovered a new constellation mm. called Columba the Pigeon. And, uh, <laughs> you do, from time to time, find unusual mm. beasties uh, it's perched on the on, on, on the, the door of it. So yeah, I know it's just a, a, a bit of fun. Yeah. Okay. So we've had an actual question come in as well about aurora alerts, uh -huh. and you're wanting to talk a little bit about auroras. <laughs> yeah, that's, so we'll get on to that. Well, we will. In actual fact, um, we, 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 right. We again are in a fantastic part of the country. Mm -hmm. um, where I live, it's 57 and a half degrees latitude north. Up here, you're another two degrees north. Yeah, I'm at 59.17. Oh, well, it's just as just, okay, <laughs> just, 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 just off yeah. the top of my head. Yeah. Very good. So, <laughs> <laughs> but the further north you are, the better chance you have of seeing good northern lights higher up yes. and brighter in the sky. Now, 
the theme of this festival is the sun mm -hmm. and people are learning through this festival that the, the, the sun is very, very active at the moment. There's, there's lots of activity within and on the sun. And every so often it throws off to what's called a coronal mass ejection, yeah. comes towards us, excite after about two, three days, roughly, yeah. Yeah. and excites our atmosphere, breaks apart oxygen, nitrogen, keep me right calm, <laughs> and uh, it then recombines. And when it recombines, it gives out energy in the form of colours and lights, oh, yeah. that's the light show. Um, and Carl, am I right in saying you have a telescope that you've been um, carrying about the festival and showing people the sun or having a look at the sun? That's right, yeah, yeah. I've got a specialised solar telescope, ah. which, uh, because we've had such great weather the last couple of days, mm. uh, it's been, uh, uh, been, been using it to show the public um, what we can see on the sun at the moment. Um, quite a few sunspots, um, lots of nice uh, filaments, as they're called, uh, and lots of nice prominence on, on the edge. I mean, it's not, it's not a super huge, uh, no super huge sunspots at the moment. Um, maybe they're on the other side at the moment. Mm. No, no. August, August was a very poor month for my solar observing, and I normally go out and observe the sun on any day that's clear enough um, but i only got two days of of observations in august yeah. um and uh, i've had one in september so far um but these last two days um have been not really excellent for for solar yes. observing and uh hopefully tomorrow again will be will be good and we'll have some more solar telescopes out by the cathedral i've actually got a couple of pictures in here that i'll show at the end you know of, of the sun through the tiny right. telescope that Colin's actually talking about and um, regarding the northern lights um yes. It's useful if you know when they're happening. Mm -hmm. And there's an app, again, that uh, we use. Um, well, I use. So it's called the Glendale app. It was uh, designed and built by a local lad on Sky called uh, Andy Stables. Um, yep. that's right. And Andy maintains this. He, he pays for the server and all the stuff. It's, it's, he's, a, he's an enthusiastic hobbyist as well, but he's very, very good at it. And it's got some scientific graphs and numbers in it. But its strength is that people who are using it can put in from the location, can you see or can you not? Mm. And that really is so useful because you go, oh, I've got a chance of seeing it because I'm only two miles away from that last person at the report. So it's possibly worth me getting in my car and going to my yeah. dark sky spot that I like and, and have a look for them. There are other groups that I know Callum and I are both member Facebook groups I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Aurora Hunters UK. And up here, there's the Orkney Aurora group. Yeah, it's the Orkney Aurora group. And there's the um, Aurora Research Scotland as well, which is another good uh, good one. And, uh, folk on these groups will, will you know, virtually as soon as there's something to see, someone will post it, uh, either a picture or just an alert to say that they're able to see the Northern Lights. So. It's usually the quickest way of finding out if there's actually something to see because yeah. it takes into account weather. I mean, there are I mean, things like the, the app, the Glendale app, yeah. and um, the uh, things like the Aurora Watch website will tell you when there's things happening in the yeah. Earth's magnetic field, which are the indicators for the Aurora. But they won't tell you if um, if your sky is clear. No. <laughs> um, no so you need to have a clear sky as well as the uh, the, the geomagnetic activity to actually see a, see a good aurora. One of the issues with people that want to go and see the Northern Lights is so they see the alerts or they see the comments or the pictures that are going up on these Facebook groups and they go outside and they go, I can't see anything. But it's because they haven't done some basic stuff. They off, people often go outside and they go straight from a, a, a fully lit living mm -hmm. room or uh, they've been watching the telly, their eyes are not dark adapted. So they can't see the faint light. They also expect to see all these bright colours. Yeah. You don't necessarily see that. You see maybe a, a grey haze. That's Interesting. So you don't see the green um, or? You can. You can okay. actually see the green if it's strong enough. Right. But it's a kind of mono... Chrome, your, your eyes are really sensitive to light but not color. Right. Um, so they go, so they don't dark adapt enough. Um, they're maybe too low down in their town or village. If they just walked up the farm track or up the side of a hill a little bit to get above the street light, 
especially the modern ones, which are very good and they're, they're cut off now, mm -hmm. uh, so you don't get straight light going up. Um, so go above the light, take your 20, 30 minutes to dark adapt. Look north. Okay. See the plough I showed yeah. you earlier on, mm -hmm. right? Look in the direction of the plough, the pole star. So there's another use for mm. that okay. skill. And look in there and try and see if you can see the, the northern lights. Now I've got, I've, I've just noticing that there's a, a picture up. So this was taken uh, near, uh, looking towards Cromarty Firth, uh, a place called Koboki. And you can see, you see the green curve, the green arc. Yes. That's the northern lights. And that's oh, yeah. often what you see at my latitude. Mm -hmm. um, however, Callum and Rusey, because he's that rousey. rousey, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, I'll have a half of, <laughs> half of an archery um, <laughs> on my yes. on my back, back after yeah. this, yeah. And uh, he may actually see because we're looking at the same thing, but because he's that two degrees further north, he'll yeah, see rays coming off it, or maybe well, we've shifted up the sky, it'll be up uh, the sky as well. Um, yes, yeah. usually, if you see rays, then and they will be going much higher in the sky. I've yeah. got some pictures coming yeah. up. Yeah. Um, of of those that um, that yeah from 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 Eric's latitude you might just see the tips of the rays mm -hmm. above the horizon whereas mm -hmm. from Orkney you might see the the arc and the rays mm -hmm. above above the arc as well. Um, this is what's called a quiescent arc, so that's one of the the normal states of an aurora. So it will sit in this this quiescent arc maybe for sometimes 30 minutes, 40 mm -hmm. minutes, an hour, two hours, and that will just sit there like that and you get this little glow and it doesn't really do anything. And then just all of a sudden, it will just sort of burst into life mm -hmm. and we will get these rays starting to appear. It's almost like a battery yeah. getting stored up and then it just... I think it's exactly that. So there's this material coming, coming from the sun and it's accumulating in the upper reaches of our uh, of the magnetic fields around the earth. And then it's just like it overflows, a bit like a bath, mm. and and it all sorts of pours out and overflows those sort of uh, containers uh, around the uh, around the earth, and then it just feeds into the uh, into the magnetic field. So the the rays are um, where the uh, the earth's magnetic field lines are, uh, are are going from north to south, and then the um, particles. Are, are just sort of spewing along those lines mm -hmm. and then that's what causes causes the rays um and uh, yeah it's just really fascinating to see mm -hmm. the science behind that sounds incredible well uh, tomorrow um melanie windridge gives yes. a talk on nuclear fusion yes this morning she's going to give a talk on the aurora brilliant so again if you if anybody's here in on Orkney and wants to find out about it come to the Orkney theater at two in the afternoon and Melanie will give us a very <laughs> enlightened approach with some good pictures I'm absolutely sure. Absolutely. So let's flick through yes. some of this and uh, be able to explain it much better. Oh uh, yes but uh, our passion and enthusiasm <laughs> is just as much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is an all sky um, camera time lapse of an aurora which uh, happened last year and if you look to the right look to the north you'll see the aurora the arc, that's the, that's the arc, the quiescent arc developing, and then bang, it explodes. That's what you were talking mm. about, Callum. Uh, overflows, should you say. Look at the rays, look at that burst. Brilliant. Burst wow. of energy. Um, it's just fantastic. So, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole thing of this because, you know, this thing's last for quite a while. <laughs> um, I do a very basic one with this. This was in March this year. These were so strong. You could actually see the color. You could see this. Wow! Um, and they were moving. I didn't. I, I didn't know how long they were going to last. So I just pressed the button on top of my camera. <laughs> and so this, these are roughly, oh, I don't know, um, second half second exposure every five seconds or something. And look at the movement. Look at the shape of that aurora curving back in itself. Now that's what you quite often get up here, mm -hmm. but you don't often get it as big as that. I am actually, Colin, expecting to see this this winter with the yeah, energy right. that's coming off the sun just now. I think definitely we should get some really good aurora displays yeah. over the next, uh, over the season um, between now and, and, and sort of April, yeah. May time when it, uh, the nights get too light again for exactly. us to see yeah. the aurora. 
So there'll be a lot of pictures going on these uh, Facebook groups that we're talking about. So, so let's, uh, right, so I was going to finish off because. Okay, um, time wise you are. Yeah, but <laughs> leave it behind. I've, we've been aiming this at, uh, you know, beginners no, basically, yeah. yeah. But um, I have to say one of my passions is, is astrophotography. Okay. And, uh, Want yeah. to see some of your photos? Yeah, there. see some of my photos. Uh, I hope my wife isn't watching this webcast because um, <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, I don't want the cost of the equipment that I've spent <laughs> the oh, no. money on, uh, to come out because uh, she might sell them for the price <laughs> that I told her I bought them for. So I'm in trouble. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Right. So this column is uh, again, this is looking over the Crawberry Firth, mm. and you can see the. Uh, if, if you're just above the hills at the back of the Firth, you can see the green. That's the green arc. And this one's yes. erupted. You can see the purpley pink rays. Now, this is only a single photograph, but if you watch that for seconds or minutes, you would see these things that look like they're sweeping side to side, up and down. Very, very active. And beautiful sights if you ever get a chance to see them. So let's just flick, uh, yeah, let's just flick through them for a bit of time. Again, that's, I think, probably the same night. Uh, I actually like the, these pictures, and this, I'm not a I'm not a great photographer. I'm good good enough, uh, but I like that there's cars coming over the Cromarty Bridge. You oh, see yeah. that that's that's car headlights. Mm -hmm. So I like the juxtaposition of that with the natural um, northern lights. You know, mm -hmm. some people hate getting uh, car lights in it. But, you know, I don't actually mind it. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it gives you a good setting. Yeah, image. yeah. I, I usually get a bit worried if there's car lights because that means there's somebody coming across the uh, across the westry first in the car. Oh yes, yeah, so that would be <laughs> difficult. Yes, 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 yes. There's another one with uh, like, oh, no, this one. Yeah, this is you, when you do when you take the road of photograph. One of the things you have to learn to do is somehow get yourself in it <laughs> in this position, uh, mm -hmm. and that's you just use a timer, stand in front of it with a, a head torch or something, point to the ground and. Making it look as though you, you know Good what you're advice. doing. Yeah. So you're, you'll find many people who do this mm -hmm. uh, have a picture like that, you know. So yeah, it's just a bit of fun, but yeah, it's good. So um, you're just using the camera with um, on a tripod? It's on a, oh, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, because although it's not long, long exposure with these bright aurora, it still has to be steady. Um, there's little rules. There's a, a rule, I think, how to divide the. Uh, the, the, the focal length setting by is it 50 or I can't remember what it is or I divide that into the and that gives you the map divide that into the into 500 or something and then that gives you the maximum amount of seconds exposure you can do there are little tips and tricks I don't want to go into that okay. yeah right. so I see this is I get I get so enthusiastic <laughs> I get dragged into the rabbit hole as they call it so I'm not going to do that but again join your astronomy club mm -hmm. the people who can do it will yeah give you advice calm don't they that's yeah that's right yeah this is a picture of a cluster called the double cluster in Perseus. This is another one of those that I could have showed you at the beginning that you can see with the naked eye is a smudgy bit mm. in that Perseus Cassiopeia area. It looks one, that's another one that looks wonderful through binoculars, I would say. Yeah. In fact, potentially better through binoculars. That one looks like it's like jewels, diamonds, and uh, black velvet backgrounds. Yes. It's, it's, that's how good it looks. Um, but with a camera set up, you can capture the the brightnesses, the colours. There's, there's white, there's pale blue, there's old stars that are red stars. And so there's a lot of stuff mm. uh, in there. But I just like the, I just like making pictures. I don't do it for science. I just enjoy making pictures. Uh, in the winter, you you have many people familiar with the constellation of Orion the Hunter. Mm -hmm. Huge bit of the sky it takes up. But there are three belt stars that go across the middle, Orion's belt. And just hanging off the middle one is a smudge called the Orion Nebula. And actually, when you learn to do astrophotography, that's what it is. It's a mission nebula. Um, what form forms like the purple and the blue dust kind of coming off of it? Well, actually, the purple and the blue is dust. It's just dust. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, no, not just dust. Dust is very important. It's it dust. It's, it, it's a solid particular. <laughs> it's a, these are that's reflection part. The, 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 this bright stars are reflecting off that. But the red, the red pink, mm -hmm. that's hydrogen. Ah. And Melanie, when she did her mm -hmm. nuclear fusion, went, you get hydrogen and it gets so compressed and condensed. 
but eventually it fuses. Yes. And when it fuses, it gives out masses of energy, which is star formation. So the new stars form, they give out huge amounts of energy and solar wind, and that then blows the, the hydrogen into wispy bits. Uh, That's and, beautiful. And, yeah, and, and, and of course the starlight is um, shown the colour off, but it's always a pinky red. So yeah, it's probably, I, I, I think I could do that a lot better now, that's a few years old. Um, but it's, it was, it's one of those that everybody wants yeah. to get, isn't it? Yeah, the, these are quite long exposure photographs. Oh, so yeah, you don't see the no, pinky colour no. through a telescope, no, unless you point. had a very large telescope. Yeah, it's possible to see, I used to have a very large telescope. I think I was able to see yeah. some of the pinky colours yeah. in the Rhine Nebula. Yeah, it? that's but the point. Okay. With a standard sort of telescope that most people would start with or, or, or or even a large telescope that some amateurs use, this, you still wouldn't see that sort of colour mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. these nebulas, and they would just look like like grey patches. But you could you can see a huge amount of detail, uh, yeah. particularly in the Orion nebula. Mm -hmm. You can see you see it in monochrome, you know. But you'll see it in monochrome, and, yeah. and and you'll see the wispy structure. It's actually quite boring, if I'm perfectly yeah. honest. Yeah. Um, no, but exactly. this is not novice, but again, yes. go to your astronomy club and Absolutely. the club scopes or the members' scopes, you'll be able to see some of this stuff. So just let's just scroll through these yes. and enjoy it and uh, let's just enjoy them. I mentioned the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, Subaru. Mm -hmm. This is a long Sorry. exposure astrophotograph. Now, this is also a cloud of dust. So these are fairly young stars. Mm -hmm. They're bright, they're white and blue white. And they're going through this dust and it's like shining a torch in the mist. Uh, it's, it's a lumen that's reflecting off the dust and the dust happens to be that blue. So, right. But you know that already because you yes. said it was just there. So, <laughs> yeah. The Andromeda Galaxy, that we can furthest away thing we can see with the naked eye column, yep. um, but it does look, you can see a bit through binoculars, nice through a, a small telescope, long exposure photograph, and you start to see the spiral structure of that, the pinky, lumpy bits that are on the outside. Those are areas of new star formation. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say new star formation, that was two and a half million years ago. Yes. <laughs> uh, and you Does can see. Does it move? Does it rotate around? Right? It will be. It will be. Yeah. It will be moving. Um, I mean, we won't see it, you know. Yeah, of course. But, but it's slowly. Yeah. You come back in a thousand years, I'm sure. <laughs> you, 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 you mm -hmm. see the things. There's also, you can see, see these smudges, yes. elongated smudges mm -hmm. uh, above it and next to it. Those are other galaxies, but they're a yeah. different type of galaxy. Right. So you start to be able to see. That's if those are actually useful. For they're they're satellite galaxies. So satellite. they're 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 rotating around the Andromeda mm -hmm. galaxy. So they're um they're, they're they're partners really. And um the Andromeda galaxy itself is heading towards us. Right. Uh, we are what we call um galaxies which are in, in our um, local group. So it's quite a lot of them actually. Uh, you know, like it's 20 or 30 galaxies in our local group. And um they're um yeah, so the Andromeda galaxy is heading towards us, but it will be billions of years before it gets anywhere near yeah. us. So there's nothing to worry about. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, that wasn't, sorry, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> when we're talking about timelines here, you are talking about billions, not yes. billions of years. So let's not. Don't worry about it, everyone. Don't worry. No, 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 sleep well. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's just scroll through some of these. Oh God, don't worry about it. This is a picture of a star oh. which has died. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and uh, this, what happens is, you know, they, 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 they burn up their hydrogen, they burn up helium, they go through a few elemental mm -hmm. burnings or fusions, and then it gets to a point where it can't do it anymore. So the energy that it's putting out isn't enough to stop the mass collapsing in itself, it collapses in of itself and it rebounds and it explodes yes. out. And this is the shell of material that the dead star has thrown into space. You think of it more in three dimensions rather than two. It's more like a, it's more like a rugby ball shape, this particular, particular one. But there's a lot. It, these are quite famous ones, aren't they? The dumbbells. Yes, yeah. These are called, we call, they're called planetary nebula um, because the first astronomers thought they were planets um, and uh, because the telescopes weren't very good. Mm -hmm. And they just looked a bit like this, just like the other planets did. Um, but then they soon realised they weren't actually planets because they didn't move. Yeah. Um, they're, they're fixed in the sky. Well, planet means wanderer, yeah. doesn't it? Planet it's... means wanderer, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, they sort of quickly realised these weren't, weren't actually planets. Um, 
Um, but uh, yeah, this is how our sun is going to end its life, most likely. <laughs> five billion years' time. Um, but in five, <laughs> five billion years' time. Don't yeah, worry so about I it. Can, <laughs> don't worry too much. Is the death of a star something we can predict quite easily? Can we see the signs and then try and mathematically correlate when it will go? I think astrophysicists do that, actually, okay. Catherine. Okay. Um, I can't particularly do it. <laughs> well, but, I um, I am aware of stars that are, at, uh, I think it's a Betelgeuse that's yeah, Betelgeuce can kind is, of go uh, anytime. One of the bright stars of Orion, Orion is, and it's a very red star, looks like a very red star at the moment. Okay. Uh, and it's one of the candidates for becoming a supernova. We've not had a supernova in our galaxy for mm. Mm. since the 16th, 17th century, something like that, I think. Um, so um, we're kind of overdue. But it's far enough away that it won't um, harm us if, I've, if, I'm, if, I've, if I'm reading it right. <laughs> yeah, there's no star close to us that will cause us any trouble. Oh, no. Right, let's continue onwards. I'm aware yeah. of the time. Yeah, cool. <laughs> this is another uh, emission nebula. It's called, it's in Cassiope. It's called the Heart Nebula for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. It's an upside down heart. And that's hydrogen that's condensed. New stars are formed. You see that lovely bright area in the centre. Mm -hmm. Lots of young, huge stars giving out lots of solar energy. Solar winds are blowing, they're blowing holes through the, the, the dust, but they're also pushing some of the hydrogen together. And you see these dark bits and pillars and arches. Yes. So that those areas, the hydrogen's condensing and you'll get new stars forming in these bits. So wow. Fantastic. If we just flick through, so the heart nebula, and next to it, somebody thought, well, if there's a heart, we'll have a soul nebula just next <laughs> to it. But it's the same idea. You mm -hmm. see all that red pinky mass with the bright new stars in the area. And then last year, there was a wonderful comet uh, where its eye and tail, which is on the left side as we're looking at it, it actually broke apart. And uh, you saw the tip of the comet was uh, giving off a green uh, coma, which is it cyanogen? Cyanogen yeah. gas, yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'm just learning how to photograph and process them. So I, I need another comet to test. To see well, there, is, there is a bright comet out at the moment, but it's very hard yeah, because it's, it's very low, low in the sky yeah. in the east and it will be gone probably in yeah. a couple of weeks. So yeah. chances, no. There have been some nice pictures of it, but uh, it's very hard. Yeah. And this is what everyone wants to get. It's the Horsehead Nebula. This used to be the sole domain of professional astronomers, wasn't it? No, Why is it called the Horsehead? Well, see the shadow in the middle? Mm -hmm. That's a dust cloud. Oh, there we go. And it, if you look at it, it looks like a seahorse head. Well, to me, it looks like oh, a seahorse okay. head. You got it? Yeah. Or, or chess piece head, yeah. Or chess yeah, piece, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, there you go. And there's another nebula just below it, uh, that branchy bit in the bottom right, and that's called the flame nebula. Um, different type of nebula. So one's a dust nebula, and the other one's a fashion nebula again. That bright circle above it, that's actually, is that on attack? That's one of that's the belt stars the belt. of Orion, so that's where it is. There's a lot of stuff going on in that area, isn't there? Uh, now, we flip down, I think we're on the last couple of slides. Callum mentioned that you've got your solar scope, yep, hydrogen alpha right. scope, and you're looking at the sun. These are safe scopes. You don't ever look at the sun mm -hmm. using an optical aid, ever. Binoculars, telescope, you will seriously hurt yourself, if not blind, permanently blind yourself, so don't yep. do it. These are specialist solar scopes that we have, either as individuals or as clubs. And you look through it and you can see the plasma on the, you know, on the, mm -hmm. the, the, actually moving on the top. That's a filament that you're looking at. It's got a filament that's uh, uh, a magnetic loop and all the plasma is kind of following the magnetic lines, isn't it? Yeah. Some, if I've yeah. got it right. Um, so this is the type of thing. If you come to the festival, see these scopes set up and it's clear. Go and have a look and you'll, you'll see it for yourself. I think I've got one final slide, which again is another sun. Everybody's heard of sunspots, so you can see in the small insert image, that's the whole face of the sun. But as I've, I've closed up and you see these, this line of sunspot activity. That wasn't that long ago, actually, yeah. that was this year. And see all these groups of sunspots. There was huge magnetic energetic mm -hmm. movement of energy going on. It's just it's colossal. I, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but it's colossal amounts of, of energy movements there. Um, a lot of magnets, north and south magnets and all kinds yeah. of stuff in there. There's a lot in that picture, actually, when I look at it now. Um, so solar astronomy and imaging is another thing that I and we do. That's, that's it. So, yeah. 
and that ties in well with the theme of the festival it being the sun. And we have a giant sun installation in St. Magnus Cathedral at the minute that you can visit if you are in Orkney. Um, I'll take to some questions just now, I guess, yeah. that we've got coming in from Slider. So you spoke a bit about the auroras before. I know previously in the year, earlier on, there was a lot of talk about auroras because people could see them all across the UK. I met a girl who'd seen it in Birmingham, which mm. was quite mm. impressive. So the question here we have is, are we at peak solar activity and hence peak aurora at the moment? I think we are, I think we're about a year, imagine my estimation if I'll get I'm interpreting the data right, <laughs> is we're about a year away. So I think we're going to be very, very active okay. this winter. But I don't think there's a potential for a wee bit more growth, um, but it's it's hard to say. If I, if, if, yeah, I think even if you talk to the professional astronomers, they will, they will, won't really commit to when the solar maximum is going to be. It's about an 11, an, there's an 11 year cycle of solar activity and, um, uh, and we are definitely on the up track mm -hmm. of the solar activity. Um, whether we've reached the peak of that or not is um, Unclear. I, I I agree with Eric. I think you know at least six months a year we'll get to the top of the of the maximum. And then Scientists heads a bit. They use words like probably and possibly. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and and then it will start reducing again. Um, but even when it's reducing, there's still yeah. good chance to see aurora. Um, and um, even when it's getting towards solar minimum. Although you maybe don't see aurora quite as often, sometimes when you do see them, they're really, really energetic oh, ones. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's um, you know, the, some of the brightest auroras that have been seen sort of in the mid, mid what they call mid latitudes, which are south of England type of latitudes. We're actually coming up to the autumnal equinox. Okay. And that's notorious, the magnetic, uh, uh, which it shifts the, the sort of protection of our atmosphere isn't quite as. It's do the angle yeah. of the instance of the earth towards the, yeah. the sun, the, the, the sort of plane of the sun, yeah. And often in the autumn, right? Just or, about, or the spring equinox. The spring, yeah. Mm -hmm. The two equinoxes, yeah. yeah. But this one kicks it off for me. And yeah. uh, I, I just get I just get hugely hopeful that we're going to see them, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, you can see them down in the south of England if they're okay. that powerful, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I used to live in Gloucestershire and we saw a few down there, so. Yeah, it's definitely possible down south of England. Um, I've got another question here for Callum. So I read a bit about your background. So you work in electronically assisted astronomy, right? Mm. So can you tell me a little bit about that and what kind of methodology is involved in it? And, and is it something that anyone can become involved with? Um, yeah, so it's a little bit like doing imaging, but it's on a sort of shorter time scale. So okay. the idea is to um, use a little camera which you put onto the back of the telescope and you can um, um, basically take lots of fairly short exposures uh, and use a program which will um, stack those exposures for you automatically. And you can see the image that you're looking at building up in real time on your wow. computer. Um, so it's a way in which you can um, sort of observe in real time, which is the sort of thing yeah. I like to do. Um, and uh, for anyone that's sort of starting to become a little bit more visually impaired, like I am, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a, a good way of, uh, of, of hunting down things and seeing things um, and in, a, in a visual astro astronomical manner. Um, whereas, uh, people doing long exposure astrophotography like some of the stuff Eric's been yeah. showing. You know, they'll, they'll set up the cameras and they'll all look at that thing for hours, hours maybe. Days, days, days. Actually, days. Some, yeah. some people do yeah. it over multiple yeah. days and they'll yeah. um, do it's much the same sort of thing. So they'll, they'll, but they'll do it, so off, they'll do it, off, they'll do it <laughs> offline. So they won't be looking at their telescope. They might have another telescope which they go off and look at things with, but um, it's kind of more of a data capturing yeah. exercise and then a lot of uh, effort goes into the processing of that, uh, that information okay. whereas EEA is more or electronically assisted astronomy is more in the moment um, and uh, if you go and look at something see it have a have a good a good view of it let the, let it build up and then you know you might spend five ten fifteen minutes on an object and then move on to something else. Brilliant um, just to round up 
So again, what would your main points of advice be really quickly for a novice like myself starting out? What are the main key bits of information they need? And is there any special kind of events or phenomena at the minute we're on the lookout for that they could try and attempt to capture? The first one is the get a, find a dark as dark a sky yes. as you want. Um, go out and just look. You know, just mm -hmm. honestly, just just look. Don't. It's nice if you can find your way around the sky, but just enjoy it. Yeah. Because it's nature. It's there for us. Just enjoy it. Um, do if you are interested, find an astronomy club. Mm -hmm. Find your local astronomy. There's not one astronomy club I know that isn't friendly. Uh, and, they, <laughs> and, 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 and they love to teach people, right? That's just the kind of nature I think that we or most, yeah. if not all, astronomy clubs are. That is honestly the best way. Um, just enjoy it. Seriously. Okay. Yeah. And is there any events to look out for in the coming months? I'm not aware of any big... There's, there's nothing really special okay. coming up um, in the next few months. I mean, Jupiter yeah. um, will become um, higher in the sky and it will be further south in the sky at, um, at, um, when it gets dark. Yeah. So that will become a bit easier to see perhaps at the moment. It's a little bit low uh, to, and it's a bit late when it starts coming up. So Jupiter will get better. Um, next year, if you want to go and see a total solar eclipse, um, there's one in North America, uh, across the USA. So if you're on um, holiday at the time, <laughs> um, if you're planning on wanting to go on holiday to the USA, then April next year is okay. a good time to go if you want to go and make probably it already booked, the eclipse, yeah. but it might already be already booked out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's one final question that's come through. I don't know if you two are the best answers, but why is there no noise in space? Um, <laughs> well, noise travels through air, and there's no air in space, okay. so there is no noise in space. Okay. I'm sure that's that a famous quote. Like I feel like there is. There's a famous <laughs> quote, I'm sure, from a film, but yeah. I, <laughs> I think so. Right. Well, I think we shall wrap up there. So I'll just do the festival housekeeping. So the festival continues until Wednesday the 13th with plenty of online and in person events for you to get involved in. Another opportunity to see Eric as a speaker host is at Aurora in Search of the Northern Lights, and that is at Orkney Theatre. It's in person tomorrow at 2 p.m. and it will also be recorded and available at a later date. Um, if you want to know more on astronomy in space, we also have the Science of the Sun, which is by Karen Mayer, which will be held in Orkney Theatre tomorrow at the earlier time of 11.30. And of course, if you're in Orkney, do not miss out on seeing the sun and seeing Callum as well. Um, it'll be suspended from St. Magnus Cathedral. And yeah, I think it's available for most of the day. Um, if you've enjoyed the festival, don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and follow our YouTube channel. You can keep up to date with all things that go on throughout the festival out with our major festival event as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine.